Hey, we're so glad you decided to join us on YouTube. You're about to hear a message from our teaching team. We hope this message helps equip you for freedom and to find purpose in your everyday life. We stream our online services every Sunday. You can visit us at freedomhouse.cc slash live to connect with us and become part of our online campus. We know that you're going to enjoy this message you're about to watch. What's happening, Freedom House? Good to see you guys. Come on, give Jesus a big hand clap in this place today. Good to see every one of you. Also, just want to welcome all of our live streamers from all over the world. Thank you for being with us today. We're so glad that you decided to join with us. And uh, remember, church, we are one church, one house that has many different rooms. And so uh, maybe you're traveling this year. You can join just like these people are joining in, uh, maybe at your beach house or sitting on the beach. I mean, I don't know about you, but I could love having some church on the beach. Come on, somebody. And I'll be right there with you, either in the spirit or for real if you invite me. So I'll be there. Uh, by the way, my name is Troy Maxwell, and my wife and I are the senior pastors here. And ladies, I heard la uh, Friday night was amazing, fantastic. And uh, so how many ladies in here would like $20? Raise your hand if you like $20. I got $20 right here. 20 stand up if you'd like $20, ladies. Oh, well, here's the deal. Register right now for, you thought I was going to give you $20? Y'all need to find a man, all right? came to the right place, a good place to find one, I mean, a church. Last night wasn't a place to look for them, but today is. <laughs> so today, and only today, I think it ends around midnight or maybe 12 noon tomorrow, you can register for the conference, our, our Speak Now conference, our authentic conference. We got some great guests. We got Sarah Jakes Roberts. Come on, somebody. We got Terry, we got uh, Judith Chris, Allie Muncie, and my favorite, Penny Jean Compton Maxwell. She's going to be here all weekend. Hey, um, uh, we're, we're in this series called Crop Circles, and uh, I'm excited to share this message with you today. Um, I, I want to share a story with you, and um, I, I want to let you know that, that, that this story is a bit vulnerable, and so I don't want you to judge me. Everybody say, I love you, Pastor. I love you, Pastor. Okay, so, so I just want to put that out there. I, um, many of you know that I grew up single mom, only child. Uh, my, my mom was P.O. Po. She couldn't even afford the O.R. So we were very poor. And uh, so what would happen every weekend is on Fridays, and I didn't know how this worked. I didn't know why this happened, but I knew my mom. We were not Christians. My, my uh, mom was not a Christian. I really was, you know, wasn't saved. But my grandparents kind of took care of us and took care of me a lot. And my mom wanted the weekends off. My dad wasn't around. And so uh, my grandparents would pick, him, pick me up on Friday afternoons. I hated it more than anything in the world. I couldn't stand it. They would pick me up on Friday. I would get home off the bus, and there was my grandfather waiting for me in his 1968 like, Bonneville. Awesome car, but I hated to go to his house. I love my grandparents. Don't get me wrong. I love Mimi and Papa, But I, I did not like the fact that I was going to go over to their house for a couple reasons. First of all, I didn't have any friends over there. Second of all, that made me work the entire weekend. I mean, I had to cut grass. I had to, you know, snap beans and, and do butter. They had a garden and everything. I worked the entire weekend. And then we went to church on Sunday. And let me just tell you, church was horrible. I mean, it was so boring. So boring. I, I mean, I just dreaded waking up on Sunday. And I would go. and But there was one highlight in my church experience. And so I would... Every Sunday on the way to church, my grandmother would turn around and give me an envelope. And she would hand me this envelope, and she goes, make sure you put this in the offering. I'm like, all right. And so I figured something out about that envelope. After a few weeks, I realized that church is boring. So I get there. I would go to Sunday school. Now, don't judge me. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, don't judge the pastor right now. Because <laughs> I'm about to tell you something that you've probably done worse than I have. All right? just want to let you know. And so, so uh, I get to church. I go to Sunday school. Sunday school was all right. You know, it was kind of fun. And then church came, and I was like, I'm not going to church. And so I told my grandparents, I'm going to sit with my, my friends. I'm going to sit with a pastor's son up in the, in the, they had bleachers up in the top part of it. But what would happen is me and him would go across the street to the 7-Eleven. I would peel back my envelope. <laughs> Don't judge me. I would pull out the $10. And in 1970, you could do some damage with $10 at 7-Eleven in the scope of an hour. I became a professional Pac-Man player. I could drink a Slurpee in less than 10 minutes. 
I mean, I killed some food, and I justified it by the fact that I was with the pastor's son. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and then I would sneak right back in. About, you know, about 45 minutes, we'd get there. About 15 minutes, we would roll in because in the Baptist church, you had to finish in exactly an hour or they'd excommunicate you as the pastor. I mean, you finished it. I knew exactly when he was done. I knew exactly when the doxology was going to come, and we'd sneak right on up to the, the rafters, and my, grandparent, my grandparents would take me home, and we'd have Mimi and Paul Paul's meal. It was awesome. But church was boring until I met this cute little blonde girl named Penny. And she took me to a church that was way different than I had experienced. When I walked into the room, it was electric. It was magnetic. I mean, there was something about the music was different. The, the feeling was different. The message was different. Everything about it was totally different. And something happened in these services that changed my whole outlook on God. I started to see miracles before my very eyes. I started to see people get out of wheelchairs. True, I watched two or three people that could not walk get out of wheelchairs. In church, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I didn't think it was real. You know, by the time I was 20, I made fun of Christians. But now I'm walking into this environment, and what I didn't know at the time is what I was experiencing was the presence of God. In an environment that was welcoming to the presence of God. I saw blind eyes open. I saw people that couldn't see out of one or two eyes get immediately healed. I saw people get healed of deafness. I mean, they talked with their hands, and then they walked out, and they could talk. I mean, it was amazing. I personally started to experience miracles. And so I gave you a definition. I don't know if you remember this, but I gave you a definition of what a miracle is. You may want to write this down. A miracle is an out-of-the-ordinary, unexplainable intervention of God. And out of the ordinary. I mean, it just kind of hits you out of the ordinary. You expect it because, I'm going to talk about this, you need to expect miracles in your life as a believer. We should expect it. We should definitely expect it in church. But not only that, we should expect it outside of church. It's not supposed to just happen in the four walls of the church. And I believe this is the kind of church that God is building through Freedom House Church. That it's not just about those that come in. It's about what we do with the gospel outside of the four walls of the church. In all of our campuses. But it's an out of the ordinary, unexplained. You just can't explain it. Like how in the world did that happen? I, 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 was, I was in debt. I needed money. And then all of a sudden somebody just came and gave me a check. Or, or just one showed up. Or, or I, the doctor said this about me. This is what he said. He said my, 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 my body is messed up. I've got diabetes. I've got heart disease. I've got cancer. And then boom, God heals me. It's just totally unexplainable, and we know that it's an intervention of God. Now, when I started to kind of discover this, I came across, I read the Bible. I I tell you, man, the Bible is incredible. I started to read it for myself, and I came across this verse that Jesus said. If you look at this in your own Bible, it'll be in red. Jesus says in John chapter 14, he said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, The works that I do, he will do also. Okay, stop. Don't read anymore. Because think about this for a second. And this is what I started to think about. Okay, Jesus just said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he can do also. The works that he did, I can do also. Now, wouldn't you agree that Jesus did some pretty incredible things? Come on, wouldn't you agree? I mean, amazing miracles. He raised people from the dead. Come on, y'all left a couple of them back home when you came to church today. You wish you could raise them from the dead. I mean, he did incredible things. If we as the church could just copy him, it would be amazing. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, if we could just do what he did, it would be incredible. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and greater works. Greater works. Now, this is not some mysterious Greek word. This is the Greek word mega. Mega just simply means greater in quality and greater in quantity. He says, you can do greater works than these because I go to my Father. Now, why why is this so important? Why why is this so significant for you and I? How can we do greater works? Because the same power that flowed through Jesus 2,000 years ago flows through each one of us who called Jesus our Lord. Come on, somebody. The same power that flowed through his veins flows through our veins. Not to mention, we're not just one man. We are the church of Jesus Christ. 
We are billions strong. That's why we can do greater works. We can team up on some stuff. We're better together. Can I get an amen? amen. And then he says this in Mark chapter 16. I, I read the Bible. The Bible's awesome. He said to them, he's talking to his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. The good news. How many of y'all know we need some good news about right now? In, in America, we need some good news. He said, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. Signs. Signs. Did a little research on this word signs. This is an interesting word. This means authentication. It's, it's like a plaque at a specific place that uh, authenticates that particular location. The other night, my wife and I went out to eat, and she she decided to order this kind of beef, this fancy beef that she could cook on this stone. And the guy says, I just want to let you know that this, this beef is authenticated. As a matter of fact, we even have a certificate of authentication where the snout of the animal you're going to eat is on there. And I'm like, no, no, that's all right. I don't need to get that familiar with what I'm about to eat. That's, okay. That's cool. I don't need to know his family. I don't need to know his history. Don't need any Vimeo videos of what he did and went through on his way to death for me to enjoy him. That's all right. I'm cool with that. See, what this means is that we as believers should have an authentication of our life. In other words, if we say that we are a Christian, these signs should be a part of our everyday life. Let me say it another way. Let me say it another way. And this might be a, a little hard for you to hear. But, uh, and this is for us who really want to see God move. Listen, don't call yourself a Christian unless you're going to really act like one. Because you ruin it for the rest of us who are trying really hard. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about the 1115 service right now. Come on. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. These are the signs. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. This is what the church is supposed to be. This is how our life is supposed to be. We are to see miracles and signs and wonders in our everyday life. In other words, we should expect them. Now, there's something interesting that Jesus does in both of these verses, in many verses, when he talks about the life of a believer. And here's what he says. If you noticed in verse 14, uh, John 14 and Mark 16, he says, he who believes in me. And then he says, he who believes in me, these signs. These signs for, will follow those who believe, believe. I want to give you a recipe for faith because faith is important. Faith is how we're going to see things happen in our everyday life, in our church. Faith recipe is trust plus hope plus action. Trust plus hope plus action. Now, oftentimes what happens with us is we got the trust and the hope part, but we don't step out in action. We, we trust God. Oh, yeah, we, we had some experiences, and that's what faith is built around. Faith is built around when you have an experience with God, when you experience a miracle, now you know he can do it. And as a result of knowing that God can do it, then we can move towards that. We also have hope. Hope is the confident expectation of good. So if I trust God, if I believe him, and I know he's given me this promise, and then I see it come to pass, then when I read another promise, then I can hope, confident expectation of good. I have a good father. We sing about today that God's goodness is running after me. His surely, his goodness, and his mercies are always following me every day of my life. Every time I turn around, I can just say, hey, goodness, because it's always following me. It's his goodness that, that draws men to repentance. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to tell people all the stuff they're doing, his, doing wrong. God will take care of that. We don't have to be the Holy Spirit. But then we have to take action. Action is moving towards what you believe. It's action. It's moving. We can't just sit back. In other words, let me say it this way. You get what you expect. Now, this is important when it comes to a church service like this because we do things in church, specifically Freedom House, in order to create an atmosphere where God can move. He, he can actually do something. Now, here's the thing about God. We are, he is not, he, we are not waiting on him. He's waiting on us. 
You get what you expect. If you walk in here and this is just kind of your check off for Sunday and, and this is, you know, my grandma said I need to come to church and, and so I know she's going to call me on Monday and ask me and I need to be able to respond to her in the affirmative, yes, I did go to church, then guess what? You're not going to get anything from God when you walk into church. Or you can come into this environment and go, God, I need a word from you. I need to hear your voice. And so everything we do brings us to a point where we can draw out of heaven. Jesus paid an incredible price for us to receive all the inheritance that he has for us. And so when we walk into a place like this, that's why we sing first. We have praise and worship. And Stephanie said it very, very good. God inhabits the praises of his people. Why don't we start with preaching? Why? Because we want to praise him. And say, God, you're invited into this room. Holy Spirit, come and, and have, have your way in this place. And then we have a moment where we invite you to receive prayer. We do that very intentionally. Why? Because we want you to act on the promise that God gave you. And we all can have that promise. So getting out of your seat and coming up. See, oftentimes we say, well, that's not me. I'm not going to go up there. I'm afraid. No, get out of your seat and come. Because just that simple action, that simple action can change everything about your life because you get what you expect. So, hey, man, how about this? How about every single time we come together in any environment, life group, team leader meeting, church, when we show up and two or three are gathered in his name, that we just expect God to come and change our world. And this is what I believe. I believe this is the kind of church. Freedom House is going to be that church in Charlotte and the nation where people can know they can come and receive a miracle from God. That they can experience the power and the presence of God. Can I get an amen? amen. So let me show you something. I think this is really awesome. This is the New Testament church. This is what the New Testament church should look like. That we should expect miracles, signs, and wonders. And they did in the book of Acts. The New Testament church experienced it. They had an incredible, incredible repertoire of miracles and signs and wonders after Jesus, Jesus was gone. So Jesus is post, this is post-resurrection. Jesus has already gone to heaven. And I want to set this verse up a little bit because there's a little bit of vernacular in this particular verse that if you don't know what happened before it, it can kind of mess you up a little bit. So here's what's happened. At the beginning of this chapter, there's these two, two this couple named Ananias and Sapphira. Now, the church is grown. It's went from, from 12, you know, 11, it kind of had a little fall. One of them got kind of messed up. Uh, Judas, he kind of messed up, went down to 11. And then they had the, the Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. They had about, started with about 500, went down to 120. So the church started with 120, and the power of God fell. And then 3,000 people joined the church. So that's why God loves big churches. It's because that's how the New Testament church started. Is 3,000 people were added immediately. They went from 120 to 3,000 overnight. And then another 5,000 were added after that. And there was an incredible electricity in the city. And they were having church all the time. They were meeting house to house, breaking bread, spending time together, connecting with each other, you know, belong, just, just really doing all the necessary things. And there were incredible miracles. And so one particular church service, they were, they were having an offering. They were receiving an offering. Now, don't, don't get nervous. We've already received the offering. So this isn't going to happen today, I hope. And so, so, so Ananias and Sapphira had sold some property, and everybody was bringing gifts into the church to bless the church, to build the kingdom. And Ananias and Sapphira sold this piece of property, and they, between them two, they decided, hey, listen, we sold it for X, and we're only going to give this. And so they walk in, and Peter says, hey, Ananias, how you doing? And he goes, man, I'm doing great. I got this offering. And he goes... Is that exactly what it was sold for? And he goes, yes, and then he dropped dead. Revival. <laughs> a few minutes later, a few minutes later, he's dragged out. A few minutes later, his wife comes in. I don't know why she was late. She walks in. Peter says to her, hey, did you sell this property for so much? She said, yes, and she dropped dead. And then the Bible says... That young people came and took her out. This was the beginning of the youth ministry. <laughs> this was the start of the youth ministry. At the beginning of the church, the youth ministry were to carry dead bodies out of the church. 
Bible's awesome, man. You just got to read it. <laughs> and now what, look what happens. It says, the apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in an area known as Solomon's Colony. In other ways, that they were having church. And it says, but no one, and this is important, but no one else dared join them even though all the people had, had, had high regard to, for them. Why? Because they knew about Ananias and Sapphira. In other words, they were like, there's a high level of responsibility if you decide to make this decision. Like, there, there's, some, there, there's a bit of concern. I need to make sure that I count the cost if I decide to follow Jesus. Like, they didn't consider this just a check it off the box kind of thing. They just considered this an all-in life kind of deal. Because the next verse tells us in verse 14, Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, crowds of both men and women. Now, notice what happened next. Verse 15, as a result of the apostles' work, this is crazy. Sick people were brought out into the streets on the beds and mats so that Peter's shadow, everybody say Peter's shadow, Peter's shadow. might fall across some of them as he went by. Wow. So th there was so much expectation that they believed that I didn't even, I, Peter, you don't even have to touch me. Peter, you don't even have to lay hands on me. All I got to do is get near your shadow. Now, I started thinking about this. I started thinking about what causes a shadow? What, what is it that causes me? Everybody's got a shadow. Everybody in this room has a shadow. What causes a shadow is when an object gets between light and a surface. And I thought, this is exactly what Christians are called to be in the world. We are to get between light, God, and a surface. See, it wasn't his shadow. Listen, his shadow really didn't have anything to do with it. It was their expectation that caused the miracles to happen. I was listening to a friend of mine preach a little while ago, <clears throat> a few weeks ago, and he told this story that I thought, he started off and it was kind of crazy. He said he was preaching and um, he's got a lot of young believers in his church and after service he's out in the lobby just talking to everybody and this young guy comes who he knows has not been a Christian very long and he comes to him and he says, he goes, hey, Pastor Rich, hey, hey can, can you pray for my shadow? Now, I'll just be honest with you. If somebody came to me and said, can I pray for your shadow? The first thing I would do is I'd probably take a couple steps back. You know, I'd maybe smell if, if I smell a little weed or something like that going on in that arrangement. You know, if maybe something was crazy there, I'd look at his eyes, see if they were moving around a little bit. Maybe I'd look over at my security people, make sure they're ready to go. Rich says, what are you talking about? You want me to pray for your shadow? How, why, why do you want me to pray for your shadow? And he says, you know, I was reading in the Bible the other day that people were healed by Peter's shadow. And I got to go to work tomorrow morning. I'm not really supposed to talk about Jesus. And I was just hoping my shadow wow. would get on my boss. I, I just thought maybe if I could just walk down the hallway and my shadow would touch maybe some cubicles and some of the people that I know need Jesus could be touched. I, I, all of us got a shadow, and I imagine there's people in this room and maybe even watching right now, and you know people who need Jesus, <laughs> and you know people who need to, a, a touch from God. You know, and, and they're kind of tired of hearing all the noise coming out of the mouth, and maybe they just need a touch from the presence of God, and maybe just my shadow can touch them. Maybe, maybe I'll go home this afternoon, and my shadow will get on my spouse. Maybe I'll just position myself just right <laughs> so my shadow will touch them just a little bit so they can experience the presence and the power of God. And they'll start asking questions. Something different about you today. Something different about you today, sweetheart. What, what happened to you at church today? Maybe I need to go to church next week. Maybe I need to experience this. Maybe you walk in your office tomorrow and you just look at your shadow and just make sure that it touches that crazy guy that tells you about all the stories he, he has over the weekends. Just let your shadow get on him a little bit. What makes up our shadow? Our shadow is our influence. Our shadow are the relationships, or, or better yet, how we do those relationships out in the world. We all have a shadow. This church has a shadow. You have a shadow. My shadow is how I do marriage. My shadow is my faith's experience. 
my life with God. When I connect with God at a level, my shadow is, is my influence, my, my, the residue that I leave over in the environments that I'm in. It's what I leave behind. I'm sure we all have been in a situation where you know you're invited to an outing and there's somebody there you don't like and doesn't like you. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And you know you're going to go in this party and you're going to have to deal with them. People ask me all the time, how do, you, how do you deal with people that you don't like? I know the Bible says you need to love them, but nothing says about liking them. <laughs> we can love them right on to heaven, but while we're here on earth, we just won't like them. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you navigate? Well, we have, because of the power of God that lives on, on the inside of us, we can determine an atmosphere. You have the ability, no matter where you go, to determine what the atmosphere feels like. You can determine how the relationship goes. You can determine what your office is like. You say, no, no, I'm not the boss. It doesn't matter who's the boss. We know the boss. So you can change the whole environment. You can get rid of negativity. Why? Because of my shadow. What goes into that shadow? What what, what went into Peter's shadow? Because I I think that's a good question. What made Peter's shadow so influential? Well, I want to share a couple things with you that might help you with this. First of all, what made Peter's shadow? His trust in God's provision. In Luke chapter 5, there's an interesting story where Peter is fishing. And he hadn't had a good day at work. It's been a bad day. He didn't catch anything. Um, He didn't make any sales. And he's got to go home and tell his wife, hey, listen, we we, we got to eat leftovers because... I didn't catch any fish. He had a couple partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sons of Thunder. They had this business thing going on, and and, and this was a bad day. So he's sitting on the sidelines washing his net because he's not lazy. He realizes that although I had one bad day, doesn't mean tomorrow needs to be a bad day. So he's actually doing what he should be doing, getting ready for the next day, which is a great lesson for you and me. No matter how bad things can be, tomorrow can be better. Come on, somebody. All we got to do is decide to make it better. So he's washing his nets. And as he's washing his nets, the Bible says that Jesus is preaching and this huge crowd of people is pressing up against him. And he's moving back farther and farther. And he does something. Jesus does something very interesting. Because he's on the Sea of Galilee and he's looking around. And I know he did this intentionally because there's boats up and down the shore. He looks at Peter's boat. And he says, hey, can I borrow your boat for a minute? Now, this is the question I think Jesus asks many of us. Can I go to work with you today? Can I go to work with you today? Because oftentimes we limit him to Sunday. We say, Jesus, you're good on Sundays. If we come on Saturday night, you're good on Saturday night. But you're you're good for the weekend. Maybe I'll give you a few hours on Sunday. But listen, listen. Monday through Saturday, that's my life. I'm just going to limit you to the weekend. But Peter uh, Jesus says, can I get in your boat? Can I get in your world? Because if you'll trust me with your possessions, if you'll trust me with your business, if you'll trust me with your sales, if you'll trust me, then you can watch something happen miraculous, and I will provide for you forever. I'll take care of your stuff. And so here's what happens. It says, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Let down your nets. Now, now Peter responds to him like any good fisherman. He says to him, hey, 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 yo, Jesus, <laughs> master. Now, I want you to understand something. He had just listened to God preach in his boat front row seat. He had been in the boat with Jesus. They put out a little from the shore. Jesus is preaching to the masses. He hears A life-giving message from God. Jesus says, launch out in the deep, and we're going to catch something. Peter does what any good businessman would probably do. Master, we've toyed all night long and caught nothing. In other words, I'm a fisherman. You're a preacher. There's no way you can understand what my life is like. But he didn't realize who was in his boat. See, when you invite Jesus into your world, if you'll take him to work with you tomorrow... You'll you'll see a whole different change. And Peter got it. He says, nevertheless, okay, I'll I'll take a shot at it. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, 
and their net was breaking. He, he kind of trusted him because no fisherman is going to have a net that has the potential to break. And this began Peter's ministry. He caught so many fish that he had to call his partners to come out and help them. And as a result of that, he fell down on his knees and cried out and said, God, I, I'm not worthy. Jesus, I am not worthy. And then Jesus said to him, from this point forward, you'll be, you will become a fisher of men. His shadow began to be developed. What went into Peter's shadow? His hearing God's voice. He's with his disciples one day. Jesus is. He's teaching them like he always does. And he's in the city called Caesarea Philippi. It's a city full of idols. It's all idols everywhere. It was known for idol worship. And Peter and the disciples are, are, are having this conversation. And Jesus turns to them in this place of idol worship. And he says to, to, to the disciples, hey, guys, who do men say that I am? What, what are people saying about me? And they all, they all said, well, some, some say you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Some, of, some people say that you're Elijah. Some people say you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he kind of turns it around and makes it personal. But who do you say that I am? I love that. Who do you say that I am? And they all kind of shut down, except for Peter. Peter, bold Peter, he says, you are, you are the Christ. Here's what he says. He says, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Knocked it out of the park. Nailed it. Nailed it. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, you got a revelation that hasn't happened for 400 years. Because up to this point, in order to hear from God, you had to go to a priest. Peter went around the order and got a connection with the Father. See, this is, this is so important for us to understand. Peter's shadow is made up of him understanding what the voice of the Lord sounds like. Jesus went on to say to him, hey, listen, this is what I'm going to build my church on. A lot of people confused that they were going to build it on Peter. No, no, no. They were going to build it on the fact that he heard the voice of God. Listen, that you and me can go, vi go directly to God and hear him. See, the issue is not that is God speaking. The issue is, are we listening? Are you listening? What made Peter's shadow? His encountering God's forgiveness. This is towards the end. G Peter is, uh, Jesus is about to go to the cross. He, he pulls his, his guys together. He tells them over and over again, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to die for your sins. They don't understand it. They don't get it. They even rebuke him and say, don't even talk about this stuff anymore. And then he says, well, I can't talk to all of you. So he takes three, Peter, James, and John, and he goes to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, hey, will you pray for me for about an hour? And I'm going to go over here and pray and, and kind of work this thing out with my father. And, and, and you know the story. He goes back and forth with his disciples, because these three guys, because they just can't do it. Peter is with them, and they just can't even last an hour of prayer. And then all of a sudden, the, the, these soldiers come. Because Judas has betrayed him, and his soldiers come, and they are about to arrest Jesus. And when they get there, there's a little bit of a squabble, and then everybody else just dissipates. Everybody just runs away, and Peter's just kind of hiding back in the back. And at the moment when Jesus needs his friend the most, when he needs the people around him the most, nobody's there. And Peter follows from a distance all the way to the point where, where Jesus is being ridiculed and accused and, and beaten. And he's kind of standing off to the side. And as he's standing off to the side, this little girl comes up to him and says, Hey, hey, did, weren't you with him in the garden? No, 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 no. Because P Jesus had told Peter, <laughs> he said, You know, you, you're going to deny me three times. And then the rooster's going to crow. And you know what Peter says? No, I'm not. I'm never going to do that. And this is exactly like we do. We make a mistake or we don't. We say, God, I'm never going to let you down. I'm going to be by your side forever. I'm, I'm, there's no way. I will die with you, Jesus. A little girl comes up to him. Just a little girl. Do you, do you know this guy? I think you know him. No, no, not me. <laughs> I'm not. That's not me. A few minutes later, this guy comes up to him. He goes, you know, I've heard you talk, and you sound like a Galilean. Weren't you with Jesus? He goes, he starts cussing. Just to let everybody know that he wasn't connected to Jesus. 
And then, and then, then third time, another little girl comes up, but, but I know that you were with them. No, 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 no. And the Bible says the rooster crowed. And then Jesus turns and looks at Peter. Wow. Now, religion would say that this look was a look of disdain saying, I told you so. I don't believe that at all. I believe that Jesus looked at him in love. I know you were going to do this, Peter. However, I love you through it. Fast forward. Fast forward. This is, this is crazy. Fast forward. Jesus has already been raised from the dead. And here's what happens. When, when we make mistakes, we typically go back to the place we were before we connected with God. So Peter tells all his friends, because Jesus is gone and it's over with, and he's denied him three times. He goes, I'm going to go back fishing. I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to go back and catch some fish. So he goes out with his friends. A bunch of guys get together. They go out, and guess what happens? Nothing. They didn't catch Jack. Nothing. They're out in the boat. They're, I mean, it was, it was an awesome opportunity. And, and Jesus shows up on the shore of Galilee. He's on the shore of Galilee watching all this go down. And he says, hey, guys, got some breakfast for you, Chick-fil-A minis. Come on. <laughs> Come on out. Come on and join me. And Peter goes, oh, my gosh, that, that's Jesus. He dives in the water. And they have breakfast. They have this great time. And then Jesus, check this out, turns to Peter. And he says to him, do you love me, Peter? And Peter goes, absolutely, I love you. And he says, well, will you you take care of my lambs? Will you feed my lambs? A few minutes later, you know, conversation, Jesus turns to Peter again. Hey, hey, Peter, hey, Peter, Peter, do you love me? And he says, well, well, take care of my, he goes, absolutely, I love you, Jesus. You know I love you. Well, hey, tend to my sheep. And then he turns to him a third time. And Peter gets a little frustrated because Jesus turns to him a third time and says, Hey, do you love me, Peter? And Peter, frustrated, he goes, I don't know why you keep asking me this. And the reason why Jesus asked him three different times is because the first time nixed out the first denial. The second time nixed out the second denial. The third time nixed out the third denial. So that Peter would encounter God's forgiveness. Do you love me more than these? He asked Peter. Why? Because when we encounter God's forgiveness... We go from unqualified to to qualified. We feel confident in what we can do. This is what made Peter's shadow. This is how how God makes our shadows when we encounter God's forgiveness. And here's the last one is what made Peter's shadow is knowing God was with him. And this is my favorite part. After Jesus has been raised from the dead, Peter and John are fired up, man. The, The Holy Spirit has fell. They're filled with the power of God, and they they go to church, man. They're expecting God to move. They're expecting the presence of the living God. And they're going to church, and on their way to church, there's this man sitting by the gate called Beautiful. He's got his hands out. And he turns to Peter, and he says, hey, give me some money. Can, Can you give me some money? I need some money. Listen, I'm here every single day. I've been here for 40 years. The Bible tells us that he's... Been, been paralyzed for 40 years, sitting at the, the gate. He's just outside the church, just, just sitting outside, just on the other side of the doors. And Peter does something powerful. He, he says, I don't have gold. In other words, you don't need silver and gold. He says, but what I do have, I give you. I, I'm going to do something I'm going to give out of who I am in your life. Because you're looking for a momentary fix for an eternal problem. And this is what happens because all of us, and this is where I I, I believe God's going to do something in your world over the next seven days. I'm prophesying that God is going to set you up. Because this was a setup. This this right here was a setup. You know why? Because this guy sat outside of that gate for a long time. He He sat out that gate... Every time Jesus walked by, and and, and I can't prove it, you can't disprove it, but I believe that Jesus walked by this guy many times, and he probably smiled as he was walking by him. Why? Because he could have healed the guy at any moment, right? But he knew, Jesus knew, that Peter and John, just a few years later, would be walking by the same guy. And this was the moment that would change their life forever. This was the first miracle that happened outside of Jesus being raised from the dead. This was the first one that happened in the church. And so 
Jesus would walk by this guy like he does all of us. He, he does this. Because you got to expect the setup. He's going to set you up this week. He's going to set you up because all of us know somebody that's sitting just outside the church. They're just outside. And they keep getting momentary fixes for an eternal problem. You watch it. They just sleep with another girl or another guy. They just take another job. They buy another house. They buy another car. They, 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 they move from city to city to city. They're trying to fix something with something that's just, it's just momentary. It, it's, it's, it's momentary. When you know that Jesus is the answer for their life. And such as you have, give to them. And maybe it's just your shadow getting on them. Maybe it's just your shadow. There's my shadow right there. Just my shadow can just, just get on them. Maybe, maybe tomorrow when you go to work, maybe just your shadow could get on your boss. Maybe when you go home this afternoon, maybe, maybe just your shadow can get on that kid that won't come to church. You beg him and you plead with him, please come to church. Would you please come to church with me? And you know he, he's felt the touch of God, but he's just outside the doors of the church. He's just sitting on the outside. He's just, just waiting for somebody. And then the Bible says, in the Peter says to him, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him, check this out, he took him by the hand and lifted him up. Forty years paralyzed. Can you imagine what this looked like? Can you imagine the sound of muscles and tendons and ligaments and bones clicking together? His, his thigh muscles coming into place. His, his knees connecting together. His, his ankle bones. I mean, as he's standing up. All of this has happened immediately. This didn't happen over six or seven weeks. This happened immediately, 40 years paralyzed. Because we all know somebody that may be 40 days paralyzed, 40 months paralyzed, 40 years paralyzed. And if you could just reach your hand out and give them what you know they need, the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me today? Will you just stand with me? Lift your hands up to heaven. I want, to pray. I want to pray for our shadow today. Father, thank you. Thank you that we all have a shadow. We are, we are standing between the light of Jesus Christ and a world that needs a touch from you. Father, in our offices, God, in, in, our, in, in, our, in our gyms, God, in, in the grocery store, Father, wherever we go, Father, we thank you that we carry the power and the presence of a living God. Father, we thank you that our shadow will be full of the power of God. We thank you that when we walk through the office tomorrow, God, that it'll, it'll spark conversations, God. We thank you that when we, when we visit with our family on vacation, God, those, those hard-hearted relatives that, that call us Jesus freaks and, and holy rollers, God, we ask you that just our shadow can touch them. And their lives will be completely and totally radically changed, God. Father, we thank you for the kids that have been running from you in our life. God, we thank you for those teenagers, those, those young adults that, that know the call of God on their life. And they're, they're, they're filling their life with a momentary fix. But God, just if our shadow can touch them. Just our shadow. God, we pray for our shadow today. God, fill our shadow with your provision. Fill our shadow. God, we want to hear your voice. And Father, we expect to be set up this week, God. We, our eyes will be open to that person that's just sitting on the outside of the doors of the church. God, use us. Let us be that church, Father, in Charlotte, that people know that the miracle-working power of God exists, and Jesus, that you are alive and ready to heal and change lives in Jesus' name. And everybody shouted, amen. Come on, give God a big hand clap. Thank you for joining us today. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and join us for online services. If you'd like to learn more about Freedom House or how you can become part of our church, visit our website at freedomhouse.cc.